Hello and welcome to Abtop. I stumbled upon Wendy's old laptop, the one she used when we first started dating. She claimed it had crashed, but when I plugged it in, it seemed fine. I wanted to surprise her with old pictures of us, but what I found left me in shock. Among the pictures of us were images of her with someone else, Bob, her ex-boyfriend. Memories flooded back, and not the good kind. What struck me the most was her wearing a locket I had given her as a birthday present during our second year of dating. In pictures with Bob, cuddling and kissing, she was wearing that locket. It felt like a punch in the gut. Wendy and I were married for five years and seemed to have a good life. We met through friends seven years ago, dated for two, and tied the knot just after I finished law school. I worked hard as an associate, putting in 60-hour weeks for the first two years of our marriage. The effort paid off, and professionally, I was doing well. Wendy, originally a teacher, quit her job to pursue her master's in education and is now in a doctoral program while working part-time. Financial strain was there, especially with my goal to pay off student loans quickly, but we managed. Recently, though, things took an unexpected turn. I stumbled upon Wendy's old laptop, the one she used when we first started dating. She claimed it had crashed, but when I plugged it in, it seemed fine. I wanted to surprise her with old pictures of us but what I found left me in shock. Among the pictures of us were images of her with someone else, Bob, her ex-boyfriend. Memories flooded back, and not the good kind. What struck me the most was her wearing a locket I had given her as a birthday present during our second year of dating. In pictures with Bob, cuddling and kissing, she was wearing that locket. It felt like a punch in the gut. I had to borrow money from my brother to uncover the truth, to face the harsh reality that my wife, Wendy, had been meeting up with her ex-boyfriend behind my back. The dates on the pictures revealed a pattern, a betrayal woven into the very fabric of our life together. Fury consumed me like fire ants chewing on my brain, my heart, my guts. The urge to lash out was strong, to punch through walls and scream in rage, but then something snapped. Numbness took over, a cold analytical detachment. I copied all her pictures to a flash drive, packed a bag, took some suits, and left a note pointing to the damning evidence on the laptop's monitor. I sought refuge at my brother's house across town, ignoring Wendy's calls. I met with a family law associate to discuss separation and divorce. We had no children, no significant assets, most of our money went into paying off my loans and funding her education. My firm circled the wagons, blocking her calls and denying her access. Wendy tracked me down at my brother's, desperate and pleading over the phone. His stern warning about unleashing his Doberman painted a vivid scene of her desperation, yet I felt nothing. The marriage was over, a reality I had come to accept. Two days later, and I still felt nothing. No pain, no anger, just a void. The question echoes in my mind, is this lack of emotion going to last? Am I still in shock, or am I permanently broken? The strange upside is the clarity I found in my work. My cases seem to have never been clearer, providing an odd contrast to the emotional fog surrounding my personal life. In the midst of this, I'm seriously considering individual counseling. It seems like a necessary step to help me process the whirlwind of emotions and confusion that comes with discovering betrayal in a marriage. Gail, the associate at my firm handling my case, has been a pillar of support. She reviewed the pictures on the flash drive and found evidence of Wendy's betrayal. Surprisingly, the news didn't evoke pain or anger in me. Instead, there was a strange elation. When I asked Gail about this unusual reaction, she explained it as a sense of validation for the choices. Since leaving, the separation agreement is underway, and Gail has set up a meeting with Wendy for Thursday afternoon. I've decided to keep all communications through Gail, except for family and friends, who seem to believe my brother and his wife will be a sympathetic ear. Gail is a force to be reckoned with, and I'm glad she's on my side, navigating this legal process with determination. As for my personal belongings and moving out, my sister-in-law took charge while Wendy spun lie after lie, showcasing a pattern of deception. It seems she even tried to blame her actions on some mysterious guy in my sister-in-law's background, a feeble attempt to deflect responsibility. Spending time with my brother's family has been a lifeline, keeping me from feeling isolated. The distraction of video games with my nephews and the supportive environment have been instrumental in maintaining my sanity. Surprisingly, work has been a refuge, with my department's overseer expressing pride in my ability to compartmentalize and not let personal issues affect my professional performance. The meeting with Wendy and her lawyer was an oddly surreal experience. 
we gathered on neutral ground at another firm, all messed up due to the ongoing pandemic, giving off the appearance of an unusual heist. It was the first time I had laid eyes on Wendy since she left for her sister's or mother's house, wherever she claimed to be seeking solace. To say she looked rough would be an understatement, bloodshot eyes, dark bags, tear-streaked makeup, and hives on her neck. I observed her with a blank expression, feeling nothing more. I'll dwell on that later. Wendy wasted no time blurting out apologies, professing love, and expressing regret, the standard script for someone caught in infidelity. She attempted to hug me, but Gail intervened, positioning herself between us. Gail instructed Todd, Wendy's lawyer, to remind her not to speak directly to me or Gail, emphasizing that communication should go through Todd, who would then convey the message to Gail and me. I followed Gail's advice to stay silent and maintain a neutral expression, expecting my initial anger to resurface, but the numbness persisted, creating an almost out-of-body experience. Todd broached the topic of reconciliation, but Gail promptly shut it down, emphasizing that our purpose was to review the separation agreement. Wendy protested, shouting about our five-year marriage and the perceived unfairness of ending it over a mistake. Gail reminded Todd of the communication protocol, and after a whispered exchange, Wendy regained some composure. Gail and Todd delved into the details of the separation agreement, with Todd attempting to nitpick, perhaps to justify his fee. However, Gail adeptly countered every argument until Todd conceded that the agreement met the legal fairness requirements. Wendy, still insisting it was all a mistake, faced the reality of her actions as Gail circled her engagement ring in every picture from the flash drive, emphasizing the indisputable evidence. As discussions progressed, timelines for the settlement agreement and other matters were addressed. My silent indifference seemed to weigh on Wendy, prompting her to spontaneously declare, without any prompting, that she never cheated during the marriage. Gail's assertiveness cut through the tension in the meeting. She demanded Wendy's cell phone, challenging her to prove her claim of fidelity during the marriage. Wendy clutched the device tightly, hesitant to relinquish it. Todd whispered something to her, likely pointing out the contradiction in her statements. I couldn't help but smile underneath my mask at the unfolding drama, though I maintained my silence. In a strange way, I felt a twinge of empathy for Todd, having been in similar issues before the separation agreement was signed promptly after the meeting. Surprisingly, the division of our hometown payment savings account was agreed upon, a tactical move on my part to expedite the process. Wendy would now bear the responsibility of paying rent and utilities, juggling those costs with her ongoing educational expenses. Despite her perception that this was a win, strategically, it eliminated our one significant asset, making the divorce proceedings smoother. Gail moved swiftly to prepare a petition for an uncontested divorce, sparing us from the ordeal of court appearances. Some good news emerged, our marriage didn't quite make it to the five-year mark. In our jurisdiction, marriages lasting less than five full years often trigger a process called rescission, akin to what's seen in contract law. Essentially, this meant the court would aim to restore us to our pre-marriage financial states. In my situation, I was a recent law school graduate awaiting bar exam results, while Wendy was a stable, employed teacher with notable educational achievements. Wendy couldn't contest the rescission, effectively ruling out any possibility of alimony. Gail cautioned Todd that if he opposed the divorce, she would involve Bob's testimony. In response, Todd assured that Wendy had agreed not to contest. With everything falling into place, the prospect of wrapping up this chapter in three months seemed hopeful. Strangely, the detachment I felt towards Wendy no longer frightened me, it had become a survival mechanism, enabling me to focus on moving forward and closing this sorrowful chapter. If you've stuck around this far, kindly hit the subscribe button, it would be greatly appreciated.